Okay, welcome again. We're glad you're here. We are going to get started now. And uh, this is 90 Days and Beyond, Measuring Effectiveness of Addiction Treatment Programs. And we are excited to get started. But first, one housekeeping note. At any time during the webinar, if you guys have questions, please feel free, just ask them in the chat, and we will get to that at the end. For our speakers today, we are extremely lucky. We've got some great ones with us. They together, they cover the breadth and depth of today's topic. Dr. Cheryl McLean is Brightview's state medical director for Kentucky. And Rhonda Roper is Brightview's vice president of quality operations for Kentucky. They uh, together help us take care of our patients in that state. And with that, I will hand it over to Cheryl. Looks like I had to unmute me. Can you hear me now? Got it? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. I was mentioning that I appreciated that uh, great intro and all the work that has gone on to put this uh, our seminar on and really appreciate you audience that is taking your hour of lunch to uh, to spend some time with us talking about the uh, addiction treatment programs. And what we're going to look at is we're going to look at the overview of the treatment programs. We're going to look at how um, things are measured. And Rhonda's going to spend uh, quite a bit of time going over some data that actually Brightview has put together based on some studies that have done have been done right here at Brightview. Pretty uh, incredible stuff. We're going to talk about wraparound services. Isn't that a cool name? You know, we're going to wrap our, our arms around you is what we say, and, and we're going to get you where uh, where you need to go. We're going to look at this biopsychosocial model. What the heck does that mean? So we're going to explain that. We're going to break it down. We're going to we're going to get you um, where you're going to go. Yeah, I know exactly what that means. Then we're going to talk about success. What does that mean? How do we define it? Who who decides success? So we're going to talk about that. Finally, we're going to talk about what, what are you going to look for in a treatment program? Say you have a family member or a friend or um, yourself, perhaps, and you're looking to, uh, to pick out the best program that you have available to you. So what are, what are some of the key things that you want to look at? Finally, we're going to listen to our patients and uh, we're going to uh, watch uh, a video about some bright view patients that hear their words and if we have some time, we'll share some patient stories and then we're going to answer questions. So again, appreciate your time and uh, sit back. Hopefully you're munching on a good sandwich or some hot soup or whatever you've got there for lunch. So let's get the ball rolling. All right, well, let's get started with just talking about uh, treatment programs in general. And so uh, looking for treatment can be certainly intimidating um, and we know there are a variety of programs out there. So we wanted to spend just a few minutes giving you an overview of just the big picture of kind of what all that entails. And so first and foremost, uh, you'll notice programs are usually broken down as an inpatient provider or an outpatient program. Some programs do both, um, but just thinking about inpatient programs, you may also hear those referred to as residential programs. And so uh, those programs essentially mean that the individual needs to go live on the premises of that program. Um, the length of time that that individual's there may vary. It may be that these programs are uh, based on a few years of length, sometimes a year, six months, uh, or it could be that they're even more short term. It could be a month or two, just depending on what services that program offers. So uh, ultimately, there's a huge uh, array of options there for inpatient programs. Something that's important to know in looking at inpatient programs or residential programs is just the fact that uh, their uh, quality of service and the type of services that they offer can really vary. You may have seen commercials on TV. I know they typically come on uh, quite frequently uh, around programs that look more like a spa or a hotel. Um, those are always some things to just be uh, knowledgeable on and as far as figuring out what services they offer. Um, 
It may be that that residential program or that facility actually contracts out their services somewhere else, or the individual actually has to go out for, you know, those therapies. Um, so just something to be mindful of there. Insurance costs can also vary with those. Uh, insurance coverage can vary as well. Some of those programs are covered, some may not be, and they may, you know, be fully out of pocket. And then lastly, just thinking about the fact that some of those programs could be more of a spa-like or hotel-like program, uh, it's not uncommon to see that uh, treatment outcomes may not necessarily always be verified. So uh, really important to just ask that question, and we're going to provide you with just some more information and tips on how to uh, do that and what to look for as we advance on in the presentation. And then lastly, uh, looking at outpatient programs, they really differ from the residential or inpatient programs from the standpoint that the individual does not have to go live, uh, you know, outside of their home. They can still stay in their home and, uh, you know, access those services at a certain frequency based on whatever their needs are. Uh, just the same as with the residential and inpatient programs, uh, the outpatient programs can also have an array of, uh, you know, variances as far as how much they are focused on evidence-based care, uh, actually tracking patient outcomes, and further just the services that they offer. Uh, you may also see with outpatient programs that they're sometimes contracting individuals out. Uh, they may have a limited scope of practice for certain services, uh, often seen around counseling, maybe even their physician or medical services. <clears throat> Next slide. Yeah. So thinking about something to look for uh, and knowing, you know, if a program is uh, really working on uh, evidence-based practice and also really working around tracking improvements for the individuals that they're serving, the term measurement-based care is uh, important to think about. Uh, measurement-based care essentially means, uh, again, that patients are being routine, routinely asked to complete uh, evidence-based outcomes measures to help determine how they're making progress in the program. That can be really important when we're working with individuals with substance use disorder from the standpoint that uh, treatment can sometimes uh, be different based on the individual that you're serving and sometimes identifying those objective changes or steps toward progress, uh, they may not always be easily identified by the patients that we're serving. And sometimes based on the scope of the needs of that individual, uh, they may be difficult to, uh, to define. So those evidence-based, you know, practices of measurement-based care are really helpful in essentially being able to see if that person is making progress and identifying some objective measures to help in seeing how they are making progress. Um, and then thinking about just measurement-based care. So not only is it important and effective in helping the individual uh, and monitoring their progress in treatment, but organizations that use measurement-based care, that's also a very helpful to tool that supports just the multidisciplinary team process. It helps with one service being able to communicate with another service around uh, the gains that patient is making. And then most importantly, it can help identify needs that a patient may be experiencing um, that may not be always observed by different individuals on the treatment team. And then lastly, uh, you know, anytime we're getting, you know, any treatment anywhere, it's always nice to be able to see how we're making progress. And so uh, that can be very motivating for the patients that we're serving. And not to mention, it can be very helpful in just funding, uh, working with insurance plans uh, for approval of services, uh, essentially being able to show that the services provided are working can really help from that platform as well. Next slide. Yeah, so measurement-based practice is, uh, is a, a major component of our services here at Brightview. Uh, we utilize several measurement-based outcomes tools. Uh, they're built into the treatment process uh, on different time intervals. So 
If a patient joins our program, uh, they complete those measures on admission. And then we also have routine intervals set up of 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, 120 days, uh, six months a year. And we also can complete those, uh, you know, if we ever see that there is a new need with that patient, or maybe we're seeing that that patient's not making progress in a certain area, or most importantly, that patient may see that and feel like they're not making the progress that they're wanting to make. And so uh, using those outcome measurement tools can really help, again, with that whole process. Um, and most importantly, can help with the treatment planning process and help inform us on the areas of focus that we need to work on with that individual. And so uh, in terms of just some examples that we use here, we do use the Brief Addiction Monitor. Uh, that's a tool that's really helpful in measuring uh, an individual's substance use, risk factors associated with substance use, things that can contribute to their use. Uh, and then that also helps us identify if the individual is making progress around their protective factors. So those recovery supports that really provide that cushioning and support to help that individual be able to advance their recovery plan. We also use uh, the patient health questionnaire. I think you'll see it on the slide there called the PHQ-9. And so uh, that helps us with being able to uh, screen and monitor patients for depressive symptoms. Um, as you can imagine, that's a pretty important tool for us in that uh, uh, depressive disorders can be commonly co-occurring along with substance use uh, as well. And then finally, we also use the Generalized Anxiety uh, GAD-7 tool as well, and that helps us with, with monitoring patient anxiety symptoms. Um, and uh, we'll just say from firsthand practice, these things are so helpful uh, just to be able to sit down with the patient, show them what their scores looked like when they first started the program, and being able to look at them at that 30-day, 60-day, 90-day marker can really just help provide that motivation and encouragement. Uh, and then lastly, you know, as I said, anytime we're, uh, you know, working on changing anything in our lives, it's nice to be able to see objective measures on how we're doing, and then that also really keeps us uh, committed in our treatment process practices with making sure we're working on the needs that are, you know, specific to that individual. Next slide. All right. So let's talk about the what and the why of the wraparound services. What, what is that when we talk about wraparound services? Well, we're talking about individual counseling. We're talking about targeted case management, peer support, even the medical services. So we're talking about all those resources that we can use to help that patient evaluate what's going on and what they can use, what's available to them in their region, in their community, within our offices. So for example, targeted case management may focus on that person's insurance. They, um, they are without insurance. Perhaps they haven't been able to apply um, for insurance, or they may need a living. Uh, they may be in, in an unsafe living situation. So that targeted case manager can really look at, at the resources available in, in that patient's location. Peer support, absolutely essential. I can talk to a patient from the medical side for 15 minutes, explain to them what's going on medically. We'll talk a little bit about that, about the brain and that sort of thing, but nothing like someone who has been there, done that and spent some time in recovery. An incredible support system. The why, why? Addiction affects every part of that person's life, financially, legally, family, relationships of all kinds, their physical, aspects of that and also of course the psychological health and that's some of the things that Rhonda had mentioned how we evaluate some of those um, areas and and help guide the treatment plan likely there's been significant damage and suffering not only with our patient but with their relationships their family their children their community their work colleagues. So, so much goes into that 
one patient, that one patient affects many, many, many different lives. Remission. Is it black or white? It really isn't. What, what is remission? There are terms that are associated with that for sure. Um, uh, sustained remission is greater than 12 months, for example. Uh, early stabilization period is, is uh, you know, that first 12 weeks. But really, it's, it's not black or white. And we're going to talk a little bit about, about success. Well, what really is that bottom line? So could we have that next slide, please? Is it that one size fits all, that treatment plan, a successful program? Uh, what does that look like? Well, it's really the patient's decision and, and we, we listen to our patients. So we customize those services for that individual's specific need. We don't say this is for everyone. Everyone has to go to group. Everyone has to do this. We talk to our patients and we ask and we find out what is helpful for that individual? We allow them to, to define their own success and recovery. What does that, what does it, what does success look like to you? We encourage and praise the small steps. Can't talk to you how much, and uh, that's appreciated by this population, how rewarding that is. Um, and how fairly, almost ne'er, never have they been patted on the back quite often. I've been told, no one has ever told me I did a good job or um, praised me for anything. That, that's a huge part of, of what we offer uh, in, in recovery programs. Walk with them through that journey. Help guide them. Help lead them. But don't penalize. Don't confront them. Don't tell them what they're doing wrong. Let's help show them the right way. The, the way that creates the successful outcome that they've chosen for themselves. All right. Next slide. Next slide, please. So what is that biopsychosocial model? Big word. Bio, life, psycho, emotional, social, community. Break it down like that. Let's look at it. So when you're looking at the biological uh, portion of that, of that model, it's the genetic or an inherited components of a person's uh, drug, alcohol, substance use. There may be some predisposition in family. For example, alcohol use disorder. Certainly there is uh, some genetic predispositions there. There's the age of initial use. We know the younger a person starts with substance abuse, the more likely it's going to develop into a use disorder and become more of a problem as they get older including marijuana. There have been some studies showing that as well. Um, there's certainly some effects on the body. There's uh, uh, physiological effects, M maybe high blood pressure, uh, maybe cardiovascular, maybe an MI, a heart attack with cocaine use, for example. There's um, the overall well-being of the physical body. That's kind of what we're looking at and what we're trying to get to when we're looking at that module. The psychological aspect, so we're looking at the history. Uh, many of our patients have such trauma in their young lives. It's They love to tell the story and we love to listen to their story. That's a part of their recovery. Many of them have had uh, trauma, um, including physical, emotional, and, and certainly sexual abuse. History of mental health issues, those comorbidities, um, particularly bipolar, um, certainly underlying depression, schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder. So all those things combine to make recovery sometimes more challenging. So we've got to address those issues. Again, we're looking for the overall emotional well-being. How can we plan a, a treatment to, to get to those successful outcomes that we're wanting? Looking at the social aspect. Looking for resources, environmental, social factors. Looking at basic needs. Some of our patients live in a tent. Some of them don't even have a tent. Some of our patients um, don't have a safe shelter. They're afraid to go home. They uh, frequently get uh, robbed. They don't have transportation. We set them up with an, uh, with a, 
an appointment for dentistry or a primary care or to get their hepatitis C treated and they can't get there. They just don't have a way. Certainly the legal issues. How do patients uh, get into the legal trouble? Well, that goes back to the substance use. Um, quite frequently, there's difficulties with relationships, with maintaining um, work, employment, gainful employment, and they need the money to get um, what the substance that, that they're craving or needing to prevent those withdrawal syndrome. So, so they're getting that, that um, resource in illegal ways. Custody of children, see this um, over and over. And this is a great motivator and one of the greatest rewards that we have in recovery and treating recovery is seeing people working toward getting their children back and they do get their children back. Wonderful stories about that. Lack of employment, lack of housing. Uh, we talked about that a little bit. Overall financial well-being. We want to know where they are in, in, in that continuum. And then uh, what uh, kind of support system do they have at home? Um, if they're in a relationship, does that person also have a substance use disorder? Is that person supportive? Uh, all those things are very, very important. Who can that person trust? Who can that person go to? All righty, next slide, please. The holistic treatment is critical. I often wonder why this isn't spelled with a W in the beginning. Holistic is looking at the whole being. What do we need to help that whole being become um, well, successful where they want to be, to, to have that quality of life that we feel like everyone deserves? We know, and ASAM says, addiction is a chronic, treatable medical disease. It involves all these complex brain neuro, neurons that connect. When we talk about rewiring the brain of, of someone who has substance use, that's what we're looking at. We're looking to change the way that that has been rewired. Uh, there's interactions of these, there's genetics, there's epigenetics, there's the predisposition that we talked about. And then there's the environment. I had a patient at five years old, um, they, their first introduction was um, with marijuana to going out at five years old to go out in the woods all day and play with their, their little uh, figure. And so that environment is, is tough when you, uh, when you are, when you grow up in, in that, and that's your culture. Uh, and then your life experiences on from that. So um, the big issue and understanding here is that substance use disorder is treatable. It's a medical condition. It's chronic. There's going to be good days. There's going to be tough days. It's going to go up and down. We just hope that we see that keep going up. Maybe some dips, but the next time it's going to go higher. That's what we want to see. Patients can and do recover. We see it. We want patients to feel safe in the environment. We want our counselors and case managers, peer support, um, staff members, to be there and be a trusting person for that patient to turn to. We want to offer flexible scheduling, morning, afternoon, um, eventually perhaps evening hours for individual group counseling and, uh, and medical services need to be uh, very accessible as well. We want a judgment-free zone. We want to meet that patient where they are. We follow a harm reduction model, which is non-confrontational, um, non, we don't penalize. We want to meet that patient where they are and help them, give them the resources to uplift them even just an inch. Again, we're going to get up on that trajectory of going up. So judgment-free, so important. You're going to hear that a little bit in the, in the video later. Uh, support through the uh, treatment process and adjustment to treatment plans for sure based on the needs and uh, the multidisciplinary team meeting uh, that uh, our clinics have and treatment programs have. So, all right, next slide, please. Let's talk about the successful patient. What does that mean? Um, and initially, we have to build trust. That person has 
um, has damaged a lot of times a lot of relationships and building trust is the first kind of the first one of the first building blocks not only trust um, with those other relationships but we need to earn their trust so a lot of times they've not had that and they don't know how to trust they don't trust um, and that's why they're oftentimes they're not facts told to us um, you know because they don't trust and they've learned that that's a very good coping skill engagement we need to be engaged we need to listen we need to watch we need to learn from our patients they also have their job to do they need to be engaged in in their treatment program show up for meetings show up for medical um, take any medication appropriately as as instructed and prescribed relationships we talked about that a little bit there's a lot of damage um, across the board typically and uh, and that uh, needs to uh, now start to rebuild family commitments huge that's a huge motivator um, and it's a huge loss for family uh, going on down to that community partner that is a huge loss as well when that patient um, has issues for example the, the legal um, issues in how that affects the communities so it, it's all these things now sometimes we might think of success as um, sobriety. Next um, slide, please. So is it only sobriety? Is that a necessary component for success? Well, let's ask our patients, what are they looking for? And, and we do that. If you're an alcohol use disorder, um, are you looking for total um, abstination where, you, where you're not having any alcohol abstinence, any alcohol at all? Um, if you're an opioid use disorder concurrent with a methamphetamine use disorder, we see that all the time. Uh, what is your success? Is your success right now staying away from the opiates, um, staying alive a little bit longer so that um, we have time to work on those other substance use disorders. That's the harm reduction model. And, and that's what we want to see. So we want to ask that patient, um, what is it, what is success to you? If it's total sobriety, all substances, that's where we head. Um, if it's partial or this or that, um, we set that client, that patient up for success. All right, next slide, please. So just as Cheryl talked about the biopsychosocial model, you know, being really important in understanding uh, substance use, uh, just the same, our programs have to also reflect that we're offering all of those needs, uh, you know, and being met through the services that we're providing. And so that's essentially the underpinning Brightview is based on. And so to take that a, a step further, uh, we really worked to uh, just collect information uh, from our systems and programs in place to really just see how our services are, are, are going. Are they working? Are they making an impact? And certainly we hear that day in and day out from our patients, but it can be helpful to, uh, you know, to be able to see some data that's collected. And so that's just what we did. Um, we collected data from our patients through their medical records, uh, through different outcomes measures that they're doing through their reports. Uh, again, those outcomes tools that I mentioned uh, in the beginning, the BAM, the PHQ, and the GAD, they're just some of our outcomes measures, and those are all based on patient report. Um, and so uh, we use that information uh, of over 12,000 patients uh, over a 30-month period. And so we followed those patients as they progressed through the program. And what we really saw here is that uh, overall there was 1.38 million data points collected and analyzed. Uh, uh, so which certainly we wanted to make sure we had a good sample size reflective of the various patients that were serving in various states and locations. And what we ultimately found here was that um, there was a clear minimum effective 
effectiveness threshold for our patients. And so what does that mean? There was a minimum set of visits uh, or participation in services that was necessary for patients to be able to success, to make success and move through the program successfully, make progress, right? And so what we saw here is essentially that for our patients, uh, the average programming that showed the most effectiveness for patients really looks like on the bottom of that slide uh, what we've put together here for our phasing that we use to guide our programming. And so for patients coming in uh, in starting treatment with us who've never never been in treatment in the first phase of treatment, what we saw is typically coming in for uh, about four counseling appointments, uh, four medical appointments, meeting with case management at least about twice a month, and two group counseling appointments typically was the recipe for success. Uh, Looking at phase two, you'll see that there, a decrease in visits, and then phase three, uh, ultimately, you know, a decrease down to about one of those uh, appointments monthly. Again, that's just looking at, uh, you know, overall. Um, and so, though still in the same, we just were able to individualize, you know, those uh, services as needed for patients. We'll talk a little bit about that in just a minute. Um, let's look over at the next slide, and I think we've got some more information there. And so what we found, uh, I loved, we put this header together, every visit counts. And so what we saw is that that minimum threshold or that minimum number of visits was, uh, was absolutely essential for patients uh, staying in the program, making progress in the program, and to take that a step further. We also saw that sometimes more visits are better. Some people need a little more than that. Some people may need a little more of the group counseling. Some people may need a little more of the case management. Uh, Cheryl was talking about, you know, those basic needs that are often not met when individuals come into our program. And so that's a great example of an individual. I can think of several patients who needed more of that case management support, those linkage, you know, with resources. And so ultimately what we saw is that attendance and individual counseling, group counseling, medical, <clears throat> the case management services, they directly impacted length of stay. And so that essentially showed us as well that if patients are engaging in their services based on that phasing plan that we showed you on the previous slide, they're more likely to, to maintain in treatment as well and not drop out. As we know, that first 90 days of treatment can really be a crucial period for individuals dropping out of services. And so as we were able to, uh, you know, wrap those supports around and helping patients get in for that number of visits, those that were able to do that, you know, did maintain in treatment uh, with us. And so one question I think that often comes up when we're thinking about, uh, you know, treatment for individuals with substance use uh, is, you know, what services are necessary? And so uh, you're going to see here uh, our uh, information really shows that all of them are necessary to meet those needs, uh, you know, those comprehensive needs, that whole person, you know, that Cheryl just mentioned. Uh, also, it's important to, to point out here that we saw if patients did, did not engage in counseling services, let's say they skipped those services. Uh, I'm a counselor myself and I'll say this, uh, we have to really work with our patients to make it a safe place for them. It's usually the, the service that people typically, you know, will miss uh, because thinking about working on those things can be really intimidating, scary, and something that a person really wants to avoid. And so uh, makes sense that those visits are often, you know, skipped in the beginning. But what we saw was that if individuals skip those counseling appointments and just attended medical services, they did fare worse. Um, they typically dropped out of treatment. Uh, I'll add a, you know, a disclaimer here to say we have some great systems in place at Brightview where we call patients if they're missing appointments. Uh, we take multiple steps in reaching out to them. If their phone's not working, we've got um, an electronic way we can send text messaging to them. Uh, you know, we take various measures to try to make sure that we do all we can to keep them, you know, engaged in those services. Um, because again, uh, we saw that if they don't don't engage, you know, in the counseling, uh, they are more likely to, uh, you know, drop out of treatment and not do as well. 
And so some other uh, just points about the data that we were able to collect just also shows us that, uh, again, people who participate in the services more frequently also fare better, and also individuals who participate in group therapy, uh, they also tend to have higher success rates. Um, and so just the same as with, you know, that general counseling I was speaking about, group can be a little intimidating, just the idea, you know, of sitting in a room with people that you don't know and, you know, going through that process uh, can be scary. And so we work really hard to help patients get comfortable with that here and also using individual counseling to help them get to the place where they're able to really uh, fare better in those group sessions. Uh, also, I think another thing we'll point out here is just uh, patients who keep their medical visits but miss even one of their clinical visits uh, per month are not as successful. And so, again, we have those systems in place where we really try to call them about their appointments, reminding them, you know, of why we're recommending those things. Again, we're not just recommending it because we have this one-size-fits-all approach, but we have evidence to support that uh, you know, these services are beneficial. Um, and just the same, uh, I'll point out here as well, the National Institute for, uh, for Drug Abuse also uh, completed a similar study, I believe in 2020. And so the data that we're showing here really replicates that as well. Um, and lastly, uh, you know, sometimes more is better and being vigilant. Uh, you know, if a person misses an appointment this week, we just got to work on getting them back in next week and helping them recognize what the benefit is, you know. And so, again, thinking about, you know, those uh, that measurement based care and those outcomes measures, those can be really helpful ways to build that motivation for for people. Uh, you know, when you have a lot of things going on, when you feel like you're at your lowest point, uh, it can be really helpful for someone to sit down with you and say, hey, a month ago, look at where you were compared to now. And so seeing some of those things objectively can be really helpful as well. Next slide. So just some of the overall data that we've collected here, uh, we have uh some just percentages here we wanted to share with you about just the impact of, uh, you know, the programming on the individual, but also on the community, on the family. Uh, you know, it, it impacts, uh, you know, all of that overall. And so uh, one of the things that we notice is that uh, patients uh, decrease their substance use uh, by nearly 70 percent uh, within the first 90 days. And so, again, speaking to what Cheryl referenced, you know, for individuals coming into uh, the substance use treatment, uh, it typically can't start with just being about discontinuing everything all at once. That might work for some people, but that harm reduction model is typically, you know, going to be most beneficial. And again, that's what we've been able to see, you know, with that decrease in substance use by 70% in the first 90 days. We also saw a one-third decrease uh, or a 50% decrease after a year in emergency room visits. And so, uh, you know, that's a reflection of patients getting healthier, doing better, being in less crisis and, uh, you know, needing less of those emergency supports. Within six months, uh, we saw unemployment decrease by 50% so far. Uh, another great example of just the impact on the individual, but also uh, in our community as well. Uh, after 90 days, uh, we saw patients report more than a 50% decrease in alcohol consumption. Uh, we know alcohol consumption sometimes can be uh, even more challenging just based on some of the societal norms and things. And so that certainly is, you know, a step in the right direction for, for any person. Uh, in the first 90 days of treatment, we also saw that uh, our patients spent an additional three days a month on average around family or supports, people who are supportive of their recovery. And I'll share just overall, that's another thing that we notice. Uh, most individuals come into the program with a very limited number of uh, sober supports or recovery supports. And so seeing that three days a month increase is huge. Uh, also, we were able to see in the first 90 days, uh, we experienced a decrease with our patients of 60% in their arrests. Uh, so again, uh, you know, another great example of, uh, you know, ways that the patient is being impacted as well as our communities and society. 
We also saw a 50% increase in engagement with medical providers. Uh, Cheryl mentioned, you know, our efforts and the importance of linking patients up with a primary care provider. And so that's just a reflection there of some of that work that's being done. And then we also saw a 70% decrease in time spent in jail. So uh, individuals, you know, being out in their communities, being able to participate in their recovery uh, rather than being incarcerated. So these are just some examples of some of the, the great gains, you know, that we've been seeing and some of the initial improvements. And we'll continue, you know, collecting this information through the great work that our teams do with our patients. Next slide. Alrighty, thank you. I'm answering a question here. The, um, <clears throat> there was a question, Rhonda, you might want to grab that real quick. What does EVC stand for? Um, and I did put every visit counts, but how did that come to be? Yeah, we, we decided, you know, every visit counts was a great way to describe that because just that data I just showed with you and, you know, all of the patient outcomes that we've seen so far are proof that every visit does count. Um, and so just as we shared, you know, that uh, missing one of their counseling appointments and only attending medical impacts their recovery and their ability to stay in treatment. And so every visit counts. And so that's what the EVC stands for. I may have gotten a bit ahead of myself and missed that. So thank you for that question. There was also a question about are all four types of visits the clinical visits? Um, it really varies, I think, by, by the person. What we saw in, uh, you know, with our patients, with, with the data so far, uh, most of the time that did reflect, you know, the four medical visits and the four clinical visits, uh, clinical being individual or group counseling or a combination. Super, thank you. So a big part of this and what, what we're trying to bring to you, the medical side and the clinical side, is integration. You can't have one without the other. It just doesn't work as well. So there's a lot of integration working together. Uh, a lot of times when my medical providers come ask me a question, what should I be doing? I, my first answer or question to them is, have you talked to the clinical um, counselor? Have, have you investigated that? What, what's going on? And so integration of, of that is so important. Um, Alrighty, so let's get to this slide. What's all this 90 day talk? Well, 90 days of sobriety is often referenced. We talk about that, you know, and we looked back at that data. Now that didn't look at total sobriety, but it looked at the first 90 days. So we know the first 90 days is the hardest time uh, for our patients to stick with the program, to stay away from those people, places, things, those triggers to use. If we can wrap our arms around and use those ancillary uh, wraparound services and help them find some resources where they're in a safe environment, they're in a supportive environment, then we can help get to that 90 day mark. We know um, that once you get to that 90 day mark, a lot of the work is behind you. Not all of it, it's a lifelong of work, we know that, but the biggest part um, uh, hopefully may be behind you and then you can build on it from that. So how do we identify stable? What does stable mean? Right there, all those check marks. Improvement in mental health. People feel better. They have more energy. They have more coping skills. That's a big part of the clinical side is, is developing those coping skills. What are you going to do if you come across that friend or that friend comes across you because they look for you? Uh, how are you going to deal with that? What are you going to do? What is something that you can do? In the moment, in the moment, what can you do to make a, a different outcome? Uh, improve social skills, building those relationships, getting a job back, uh, getting uh, uh, your family back together, getting the, uh, the credibility to show that you can take care of your children, for example. Family reunification, obviously big. Um, so many family relationships have been damaged in that uh, addictive uh, behavior prior to recovery. So stable housing, uh, many of our uh, patients um, because of financial issues, relationship issues, uh, et cetera, don't have stable housing. So we need to get uh, those resources and that's where that targeted case manager can help out there. Decreased emergency room utilization, absolutely. Uh, legal issues we talked about, absolutely. Um, 
less jail time, less incarceration, means they're available more to work their programs. They're available more to work on some of those things to get their life back in order and um, and and get on that uh, what they want as to be their successful outcome. Um, the overall longevity of sobriety, for sure. All right, next slide, please. What uh, does standardized care mean? How, how do we do it? How do we measure it? So st standardized care is basically uh, the same process, the same um, uh, treatment produces the same or similar outcome. So this is typically based on best practices, evidence-based medicine, prior studies. You're looking at, the, at what was done and then the outcome, and then you're trying to put that into a workflow of process so that you can help decrease um, uh, patient um, uh, risks. Um, it decreases errors. It improves the consistency of care. Again, we're looking for those uh, treatment processes. It could be medication. It could be um, utilization of those um, tools that Rhonda referenced earlier. So uh, what we're doing is we're looking to see a consistency. So how do we do that? Well, we educate. Um, we um, have a long way to go in many ways with uh, some of our uh, uh, criminal justice system. Uh, I'm happy to say I did a study uh, years back and hardly any of the jails around the United States had MAT programs. And um, as a result of that, the first two weeks out of jail is the highest uh, risk for overdose for those uh, inmates that were released, up to 40 times greater risk for overdose, and, and there's reasons behind that, but, but you know, educating, um, transparency, again, putting out some of that data that Rhonda had uh, has, has referenced, uh, hold of, of programs accountable to best practices and outcomes. So that hasn't been done a lot, but it is starting to be done in this in this uh, arena. So again, we want to look at evidence-based indicators that are going to show us at-risk patients. What do we know when this patient, for example, as Rhonda referenced, drops out? They're still coming to medical, but they're dropping out of their clinical. They're, uh, they're not staying. They're not engaged. What do we know about that based on the, the studies that we've looked at? Well, we know that they're not as likely to be successful as if they're engaging and, uh, and doing all their services. So we can hopefully intervene with some of those calls that we've talked about. Um, we're gonna look uh, at uh, successful programs um, that look at that versus the poor performing programs as well. So, so that's some of those items. Next slide, please. Community impact, what's in it for me? We've got to answer that for our patients, but we also have to answer it for every one of us, improved quality of life. Again, not only for our patients, but for their family members, for their children, for the community. There's those financial rewards. Now they're, they're gainfully employed. They can go out, they can pay for their housing, um, children, presents. They're, they're financially stable. Reduction in unemployment that leads to uh, gainful employment and then again those financial stability. Decreased emergency part department, we've talked about that, that uh, increases the resources available for other community members that, that really as well need those emergency services. Um, increased um, uh, care in the primary care arena, which overall improves uh, quality of life, um, longevity, longevity, and uh, certainly days lost to illness. So leading to overall community wellness and uh, uh, this reduction in arrest and incarceration, once again, just um, improves the community and, uh, and the distress. And we'll go on to that next slide, please. So looking at this, again, what's in it for me? Go on to, the, if you'll click that again, wanting to look at this across the board, decrease in deaths, we know that particularly um, those in MAT and the opioid use disorder, some of the advances that we've made in that area, 
and we know that treatment saves lives. That doesn't mean medication. It doesn't only mean counseling. It means that integrated services where we wrap our arms um, around that patient. Already, next slide, please. So summary here. We're going to look at breaking that cycle of addiction. What does that mean, Rhonda? Yeah, the cycle of addiction can mean lots of things. I think, uh, you know, getting one day without using can be breaking the cycle for, you know, for a person. Um, being able to get through, you know, one one day. Uh, it can also be, you know, breaking a, a cycle that's often common within a family. Uh, it may be that that individual is the first person who has, you know, started treatment or entered treatment or asked for help or even acknowledged that there's, you know, potentially a problem. And so uh, that typically are some of the things that we're seeing around that concept. Yeah, providing the tools for successful recovery. Again, that goes back to listening to our patients. What do you see as successful? What do you need? What do you not have? What can we help you get? We know these folks have oftentimes low self-esteem, low self-worth. We need to build that. We need to get that uh, trust. We, we need to get that engagement so that we can build that patient toward where they want and, and need to be. What do you think about the successful programs, not patients? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, sometimes it can be, uh, you know, it, while sharing our data and things is really, you know, important, we wanted to just show you, you know, that because we feel like that, uh, you know, that says a lot about what is needed for services and that really fits with that biopsychosocial model. We're going to share some patient stories with you as well because hearing that directly from the patients that we serve, you know, is often, uh, that helps, I think it, everything hit home even more. Um, but, uh, you know, our programs are a reflection of our patients. And so our patients maintaining with us in treatment, uh, you know, and what our patients say about us from word of mouth, uh, you know, I think that's what that's referring to. Uh, those are two of the best markers of success for a program. Great. And increasing accessibility to quality addiction centers, residential, outpatient, those wraparound services, all those things that that Rhonda had mentioned initially. And finally, let's let's listen to our patients. Let's go to that. I think I'm setting a trend here, man. I think I'm breaking the family curse with, with this uh with this step that I'm doing for real. Honestly, I didn't think addiction was even over overcoming it. I didn't think it was actually gonna be possible, but uh it just I had a lot of doubts in my mind. But with White View is uh you get everything in one set and it, they give me a refreshing, a refreshing thought mind frame, and basically, I uh, just came, just realized that I can, I know I can do it with Bright View for sure. You want your world back? Go to Bright View. You want to feel like human again? Bright View. Yeah, I feel like I get treated just like everybody else would, and everybody's nice, and it's it's just totally different from any other clinic. I think when you get chances to clean yourself up, you might want to take those chances, you know, it's, you don't get too many of them. Uh, God bless your souls, I've had so many, you know, that didn't get a chance. So many of my friends, family, and all that, they didn't get a second chance to do it, so. I don't want my kids to see, you know, my son should see their father a hard working, good guy. I'm trying to raise him in the church, I'm trying to be active in the church. <laughs> Uh, active in school, you know, I just, I try to show them, you know, what I wasn't doing. All right. So there are some ways um, here that you can refer new patients. There's the call center 24 uh, seven. You can go online, walk in. We accept walk-ins up until 3 p.m and uh, and provide those services on that day. So we meet that patient when they're ready to be um, in treatment. So oftentimes if that patient walks in, you might not get that chance again if you let them walk out. So we grab every opportunity uh, to get that patient uh, on that road to, uh, to recovery. And I love it over here, uh, sober, uh, living sober, living sober. So. Awesome. Um, Alrighty. Um, 
Any uh, questions? I know we have uh, maybe three minutes left. One of the questions uh, that, that was asked is what happens if a patient leaves the program and they come back? Great, great question. Um, so from a medical perspective and clinical perspective, um, we almost never discharge a patient. It's their choice to leave. And in that way, there's no confrontation with that patient and that patient can come back any time. And we open our arms. How many times have you heard someone who's uh, trying to quit smoking? Uh, how many times have they tried to quit? I had a colleague who was a medical doctor when I was in residency, 32 times, and then he quit. So uh, we're there. Come on back. That's great. And um, I just put into the chat for everybody a link to the slides and to a certificate of attendance. We still have a few more questions, but I just wanted to get those out there for everybody, since I know some folks have to go to other meetings. Um, next question, what do you do when a patient continues to use illicit drugs? Yeah, we, we really want to work, you know, with that patient and identify, you know, what are the contributing factors? Uh, and so there's not one answer to that. But what I would say is looking at what's happening with that patient in their life and their environment. It could be that that patient is, you know, in a, a living situation where they're uh, with other people who are using substances. Uh, it may be that they need, uh, you know, more sober supports. Um, they may need engagement and, you know, some hobbies or activities, uh, you know, to help with just positive fulfillment of their time. Uh, and then, you know, on a more serious note, it may be that uh, there are, you know, other contributing factors. There could be, uh, you know, things that are happening with, uh, you know, related to mental health, or uh, it could be that they're experiencing, you know, cravings or uh, triggers that we need to help them, you know, with working on around their relapse prevention plan. Uh, coping strategies. And so uh, ultimately to answer your question, I would say that we have to look at that individual specifically, talk with them about what's happening, what's contributing to that continuing to happen, what goal are they looking to work towards and help them with, you know, the supports to get that plan in place. So very individualized there. That's great. And um, where is Brady located and what kinds of insurance does it take? I can tell you that for locations, if you just go to our website, we actually have uh, nearly 100 different locations in eight different states. Uh, so that's probably the easiest way to answer that question. And um, Rhonda, if you could jump in regarding insurance. Yeah, I believe uh, we typically take all insurance plans uh, and then we even work with patients if they don't have insurance available with helping them look for resources uh, and support, you know, to get engaged in treatment. That's great. And uh, what are your feelings in regards to evidence based treatment regarding face to face counseling versus uh, zoom meetings telehealth? So we use a combination, actually, uh, you know, one thing we really were able to uh, get some great practice with during, you know, uh, just the recent, uh, you know, COVID uh, emergency that we've been in in our uh, in our you know world here is uh, really making good use of telehealth services. So we offer telehealth uh, services for individual group for uh, all of the services that we offer. And so uh, it really is based on the individual. And so. Uh, typically, you know, when individuals are starting in recovery, most people benefit from having some in office appointments uh, just to make that connection to the program. Uh, but even then, uh, you know, individuals may be appropriate for, you know, telehealth services. So we use a combination and uh, I believe, you know, new research that comes has come out has really shown us that they're equivalent as far as that goes uh, telehealth compared to in, in office uh, just as effective. Okay, and we've got time for one more here. <laughs> How does someone find out if their insurance covers rehab? Yeah, um, I think you're, if you're, you're able to call our uh, 
our number. Uh, you can reach out to our call center and they can uh, help you with that process and let you know uh, what plans are known as far as those that we're taking. That would probably be what I would suggest as your first step. Uh, you can also uh, always, you know, call the number on the back of the card, but uh, I would just say to start with, uh, you know, contact uh, our um, hotline number and we'll pull that slide up so everyone has that here. Um, but there's someone there 24-7 uh, to take the call. You can let them know what your insurance plan is. Um, so that 833-510-4357 would be a great place to start. That's great, Rhonda. Thank you so much. Cheryl, same to you. We really appreciate your time today. This has been a, a great presentation. If we did not get to your questions uh, in the chat, we will be following up with you guys after uh, the, the presentation. But we do appreciate everybody's time and uh, hope you have a great day. Thank you so much. Bye.